Hello, my name is Eva Monday, and I'm the Publicity Manager for Tundra Books, Puffin Canada, and Penguin Teen Canada. Our publishing team is located in Canada, but we publish authors and illustrators from around the world. We are the North American publishers of Ben Clinton's popular Narwhal and Jelly books, David A. Robertson's indigenous middle grade fantasy Lemisua saga, and Shiran J. Zhao's best-selling YA phenomenon, Iron Widow, among other titles. All of the books that I'll talk about today are available across North America and can be ordered from your preferred wholesaler or by contacting your Random House Children's Book Sales Rep. Wouldn't it be really mean if they couldn't? Today, we wanted to quickly chat about a dozen books that we think fall into a few categories and themes that we know readers and educators are looking for. But this is just a small sample of our list, so please visit tundrabooks.com to see the full catalog, access downloadable materials, and find out more. First, we'll take a spin by some books that look at what makes a family. The idea of a neat nuclear family has always a bit of an illusion, but books for young readers haven't always reflected the complex and different groups that we call families. Enter the Family Tree, a picture book by Sean Dixon and Lily Snowden Fine. The book explores the different ways that families are created and how the modern family is more diverse and welcoming than ever before. When her teacher gives her class a simple family tree assignment, Ada is stumped. How can she make her family fit into the simple template? Ada is adopted. She can see where her parents go in the tree, but what about her birth mom? She has a biological sister, but her sister has different adoptive parents. Where do they go on the tree? What about the foster kids who are being raised by her former foster parents? This book is a great way to open conversations about family arrangements, what we think of as typical and why. Sean Dixon is an accomplished Toronto playwright, of a, but this is his first picture book and based largely on his own experience of fatherhood. And a fun fact about illustrator Lily Snowden Fine, she used to be the voice of Peppa Pig. On that same theme of family and adoptive family, especially, comes The Language of Flowers by author illustrator Dina Seiferling. Deep within a magical meadow, some lonely flowers receive a very special gift, a baby bumblebee in need. The flowers name this baby bee Beatrice, get it? They care for her and help her find her wings. And as she grows older, Beatrice learns the language of her floral family, messages of kindness and appreciation that she delivers between them. And with each sweet word, the flowers bloom until the meadow becomes so big that Beatrice needs her help or needs help delivering her messages and decides to go out in search of her own kind. More bees. No need to start screaming like Nicolas Cage in The Wicker Man though. Even though this little bee's quest takes her beyond the safety of the meadow and into a dangerous swamp filled with strange plants and snapping jaws and terrible teeth, Beatrice's sweet words would come to her rescue. After all, much of the book is informed by the Victorian practice of floriography, the use of flowers to communicate unspoken feelings. You can check out the legend in the back. Not only is this gentle and quaint tale about science, the miracle of pollination and the important relationship between flowers and bees to be specific. It's very much about adopted families and how the secret to flourishing is kindness and appreciation. And while we're talking about adopted families, you can't forget to mention bookseller favorite Burt's Way Home by John Martz, a graphic novel from the creator of Evie and the Truth About Witches and a cat named Tim. A cosmic accident has left alien Burt stranded on earth, or so he says. He's from a distant galaxy with an advanced technology, but an accident has made his parents disappear and trapped him here on Earth. And no matter what he does, he can't seem to get the primitive Earth technology to work well enough to get him home. But everyone feels like he looks a lot like a regular bird. From the perspective of his foster mother and a similar looking bird, Lydia, Bert is a confused and lonely little boy who's difficult to understand and lives in his own world but she's less focused on understanding him than she is on taking care of him and supporting him. Bert struggles to adjust to his new home and Lydia tries her best. But when Bert embarks on one final plan to find a way to teleport home and ventures into the cold all alone, Lydia will have to find a way to bridge the gulf between them. This is a dynamic and early graphic novel fable of foster care and the meaning of home. Bert's use of fantastic story to make sense of his situation and the loving care of his foster mother, Lydia, sensitively depict the struggles of foster children and their guardians in a way that young readers will easily relate to. It's hard to admit, but one thing everyone has dealt with a lot more in recent years, and that includes young readers, is grief. A devastating worldwide pandemic will do that. And so we wanted to highlight a couple of our picture books that discuss going through grief, starting with A Garden of Creatures by Sheila Hetty and Esme Shapiro, a moving picture book about loss and some big existential questions.
Two bunnies and a cat live happily together in a beautiful garden. But when the big bunny passes away, the little bunny is unsure how to fill the void she left behind. A strange dream prompts her to begin asking questions like, why do the creatures we love have to die? And where do we go when we die? How come life works this way? With the wisdom of the cat to guide her, and I think we naturally assume the cats to be a little wiser than bunnies, the little bunny learns that missing someone is a way of keeping them close. And together they discover that the big bunny is part of everything around them, the grass, the air, the leaves, for the world is a garden of creatures. Though it deals with a difficult subject, a garden of creatures uses endearing illustrations and a life-affirming message to show how interconnectedness of nature and the sweetness of friendship can be a warm embrace even during the darkest of times. Hetty, you know, for adult novels like How Should a Person Be and Motherhood, is known for asking these probing questions, and Shapiro's lush and beautiful illustrations are a perfect accompaniment. A Garden of Creatures approaches death and dying in a gentle yet open and unpatronizing way, and the discussions that make up the story will prompt thoughtful, important conversations between young readers and their guardians or educators. If you need a book to discuss grief, but a garden of creatures doesn't sound like your cup of tea, might we recommend A Tall Glass of Rodney Was a Tortoise by Nan Forler and Yongling Kang. This is a more gently humorous children's book about bereavement, though no less moving. Bernadette and Rodney are the best of friends. Rodney's not so good at playing cards, but he's great at staring contests. His favorite food is lettuce, though he eats it very slowly. When Bernadette goes to sleep at night, Rodney is always there, watching over her from his tank. If this is not yet clear, maybe the title will help. Rodney is a tortoise. But as the seasons pass, Rodney moves slower and slower, until one day, he stops moving altogether. Without Rodney, Bernadette feels all alone. She can't stop thinking about him, but none of her friends seem to notice, except for Amar. And the kindness and empathy of her human friend Amar helps her manage her grief. With spare text and dialogue, this the story explores how kids can deal with big feelings in positive ways. The book can serve as a conversation starter for adults, though adults did not feature heavily in the story. Bernadette's grief is helped rather by a new friendship with a boy at school, and the book focuses on that power of friendship. The book has already received two star reviews, including from the Horn Book, who say, this tender story about losing a friend and making room for a new one ends on a realistically hopeful note. Moving on, we're going to talk about what my mom told me to do in a job interview or on a date, but not in front of a state judge, be yourself. And we start these books that celebrate individuality and personality with My Lala. My Lala is a picture book by acclaimed Cherokee author, Thomas King, author of The Inconvenient Indian, and illustrator Charlene Chua of Amy, Amy Wu and The Perfect Bow. Lala wakes up one morning and decides that she owns the world. She bounds to her box of treasures and finds her shiny red dots to mark what is hers because there's nothing that's not in her opinion. Lala's bear gets a dot, as does her blankie, boots, even the marker she uses to make scrawls on her walls. And when she finishes labeling everything in her room and goes to label her dad daddy socks, Lala realize, realizes that she's running out of dots. But when Lala discovers that she can simply create her own red dots, will anything be safe from Lala? Readers can join a rambunctious Lala on her quest to own the world in this joyful picture book that celebrates confidence and positive thinking. The book is a celebration of a little girl's confidence, and Lala is a ex perfect, exuberant, and carefree protagonist. And Schwa's vibrant art is a great match for King's humorous and vibrant writing. And there's really no better way to be yourself than with a book called Myself, Yourself by Esme Shapiro. And if that name sounds familiar, she's the illustrator of the previously mentioned A Garden of Creatures. Here she's on writing and illustrating duties for this book about loving all the things that make you, you. Follow along with lovable forest creatures as they discover what is a self and what makes each of us unique. From the way you button your coat to the way you tap your toes, from the top of your head to your adorable tummy, there are so many reasons to love yourself and so many reasons to be loved. Yourself is the only self you have, and myself is not yourself. But what is a self? Whatever it is, it's what makes you, you. Readers will join a group of endearing forest creatures as they bake and eat cranberry butter pie muffins, sing silly songs at bath time, and stop to smell the chestnut nettle roses, all the while exploring their individuality. This joyously affirming picture book from the inimitable, 
inimitable Esme Shapiro encourages the youngest readers to get to know and love and be kind to their wonderful selves and the equally wonderful selves around them. The book celebrates differences and is filled with adorable characters that are sure to be hits, like these little turnip folks. Myself Yourself is a great gift for baby showers, birthdays, graduations, bar and bat mitzvahs, quinceaneras, and similar milestones. But let's not sleep on chapter books, where, in my opinion, some of the most interesting writing is happening. And with good reason. This reading stage is such an important one in young readers' lives. Luckily, we've got some great books to offer them, like Esme's Birthday Conga Line by Lourdes Hoyer and illustrated by Marissa Valdez. Esme lives with her grandparents in the uppermost floor of the topmost best building. It's her birthday. Mimi and P Pipo give her a beautiful guitar, but they didn't plan a birthday party. That's no problem. Esme is great at problem solving. Esme always has a plan. And with the help of her cat, El Toro, and a lot of help from her neighbors in the topmost best building, the ir irrepressible Esme gets the birthday party of her dreams. It's a very funny and sweet early, early illustrated chapter book about a problem solving girl. The first in the series from a debut Cuban American author and populated by the wonderful and diverse characters who make up her high rise apartment. And if you like funny, but maybe need a dash of Wes Anderson-esque quirk and design, The Further Adventures of Miss Pettifor could be for you. Acclaimed novelist and poet Anne Michaels, author of Fugitive Pieces, returns to her children's book heroine Miss Pettifor and her feline friends for more flights of fancy in this collection of stories illustrated by Emma Block that celebrate language, storytelling, and all the pleasures of life, large and small. And though you may want to pick up the first book of this modern child-free Mary Poppins, The Adventures of Miss Pettifor, the books stand on their own and are quite episodic, made of short, self-contained chapters. After all, Miss Pettifor enjoys having adventures that are just the right size for a single magical day. With her 16 cats and the aid of a tablecloth as a makeshift balloon, Miss Pettifor soars, which is to say she rises high in the air and flies, over her charmingly eccentric village, encountering adventures all along the way. One never knows where the wind will take her, perhaps to the aid of a hapless handyman and an onion loving baby, or to a coconut confetti parade, or in search of keys, lucky charms, or even simply the perfect tablecloth for her next flight. The chapter book is a witty, whimsical, beautifully illustrated and designed collection of tales. But if the young readers in your life have moved on to middle grade, we have some must-read middle grade novels to mull over, starting with The Secret Diary of Mona Hassan by debut author Salma Hussein. Deeply informed by The Secret Diary of Adrian Mole, aged 13 and three quarters, this book features a young Muslim girl growing up in Dubai, United Arab Emirates, when the first Gulf War breaks out in 1991. It's a period piece, as horrifying as it is for me personally to think of 1991 as period piece material. The war isn't what she expects. She says, we didn't even get any days off school, just my luck. Especially when the ground offensive is over so quickly and her family peels the masking tape off their windows. Her parents, however, fear there is no peace in the region and it sparks a major change in all of their lives. Over the course of the year, Mona falls in love, speaks up to protect her younger sister, loses her best friend to the new girl at school, has summer adventures with her cousins in Pakistan, immigrates to Canada, and pursues her ambition to be a feminist and a poet. The book is an authentic portrayal of what growing up female in the Middle East felt like in the early 1990s and what being a Muslim immigrant to North America during that same period was like. But very importantly, it's also very funny. Next, we have more middle grade with Double O Steven and the Ghostly Realm, a book full of ghosts, pirates, and family secrets by Angela Arn. Steven loves pirates. What he doesn't love is his name, Stephen O. O'Driscoll. He believes when his Korean mother and Irish father gave him that name, it was just one cruel setup for being teased. When he gets suspended from school for doing proper pirate and training things, like using sticks to practice sword fighting, that same Korean mother doesn't let him sit around doing nothing. Instead, she takes him to a museum, which is where he finds himself face to face with a real honest pirate ghost. Captain Sapperton needs Stephen's help to cross over to the other side, and his former ghost crew are intent on making sure Stephen follows through, whatever it takes. And this pirate adventure will not only take them farther into the ghostly realm, but also closer to home, where a long-held family secrets reveal surprising ties to the spirit world. This is a fun adventure story for fans of ghosts and pirates, but also a nice mother-son adventure story too. 
Finally, we have The Stone Child, the third book in David A. Robertson's wildly popular Misawa saga, and it's the scariest one yet. David Robertson is a Winnipeg-based Cree author for children whose profile has been growing steadily over the past few years. In 2021, he published a picture book on the trap line, which won the 2021 Governor General's Award here in Canada. And his Misawa saga series, which he calls a sort of indigenous Narnia, was optioned for television by ABC Signature. The first book in that series, The Barren Grounds, was also a global read aloud selection, which brought it to a much wider audience. He was also named Children's Storyteller of the Year by our national paper, The Globe and Mail. In the series' third installment, after discovering a near lifeless Eli at the base of the great tree, spoiler alert, I guess, Morgan knows she doesn't have much time to help save him, and it will mean asking for help from friends old and new. Racing against the clock and with Eric and Emily at her side, Morgan journeys deep into the northern woods, a place they've been warned never to enter, facing strange and terrifying new dangers. As I warned you, this book is the closest to horror the series gets, so it's a bit spookier than you might expect. These books are hits with kids, and Dave is constantly speaking at festivals and schools, and there's never been a better time to hop onto the series than with lucky number three. Be sure to visit tenderbooks.com where you can download our activities and kits. Most of our titles have activities or discussion guides that you're free to use, as well as helpful book lists, quizzes, catalogs, and more. And follow us to get in touch on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. We're not on TikTok just yet, uh, but we love talking with readers. Thank you so much for listening, and please enjoy the School Library Journal Day of Dialogue. Take care.